You should be proud of the fact that you made it. You made it. And do not take this seat that you have for granted. It was really exciting for me. The first day you had students in class to sit in both of your classrooms and just watch the way you work. My name is Mr. Barbier. It's spelled B-A-R-B-I-E-R. -E and there were certain things that really crossed over in your styles and then other ways that you were completely, completely different. So my name is Ms. Wilson. This is Urban Health class. Day one. I wanted to have a conversation about what are the things that you do to set up your kind of classroom culture, your classroom norms on those first days. So I think what Kai is getting at is that maybe it's not as orderly or as strict or as structured as it is here. Things that I saw that both of you did, made an effort to do, um, calling students by their names yes. um, right away. Tell me your name, Natasha. You both had an organized syllabus to hand out. What's the purpose of the syllabus? What is a syllabus? Kind of like a guideline. Exactly, a guideline. That's a good word. You're going to catch on really quick, ladies and gentlemen. I give a test at the end of every week. You had expectations for the first day of class, where they were already active in class. My name is Jennifer, and I like to know more about genetics. Something else that you guys had in common, though, was this kind of like getting the students to talk right away, kind of a question and answer thing, even when they were kind of low risk kind of questions. It has to be whole, but it has to be either what or what. Positive or negative. Beautiful. Things were, that were really different are your whole classroom setup, Ms. Wilson, is very different from Mr. Barbier's. Mr. Barbier actually has the kind of more old fashioned rows set up, True. and Ms. Wilson has the kind of U shaped tables. And I thought that was interesting because there's a lot of pushback on the row. Thing, which actually works very well for you. You should be copying this down. I know just from experience of working with you all these years that you both create a very strong classroom culture. The students really respect you and respect your the classroom space. But you have these kind of really different styles in some ways. I guess I wanted to get your take on how that is and why you make the certain decisions that you make in the way you first approach them. Considering the fact that I teach students with very weak math skills, it's important to establish with them this feeling of community and oneness that, you know, we're all here for the same reason. Week three, division. Because they discover very quickly, obviously, once they look at the syllabus, that it's a course in which they will build their basic math skills. Mm -hmm. So of course, the first thought that comes to their mind is, wow, you know, I'm back in elementary school. You know, I'm learning, you know, how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide all over again, or I was taught this already. I want you to be very, very honest with yourself, because you're in the right place. You should feel comfortable being here. It was really clear to me that part of the goal here was to make them feel comfortable. I mean, math is such a terrifying subject for so many kids, and they have, there's so much anxiety around it. How many people here, maybe to some degree, would say that they have maybe a little bit of math phobia inside of them? Okay. <laughs> One of the first things you do is ask the kids to raise their hand if they have had struggles with math, you know, which is one of those basic things of like, you know, a way of eliciting a response, but also for them to get a visual on, like, oh, I'm not the only one in here that doesn't get this stuff. Math anxiety is real. It's, it's a very real thing, you know, and it takes time. And you're going to realize day by day, your confidence is going to increase, your knowledge is going to increase, and your skill level is going to increase. I'm asking them, one, to get over their own personal fear, mm -hmm. and two, I'm asking them to, you're making yourself vulnerable, basically. You're, you know, you're opening yourself up to these people and you're making them aware of the fact that you don't know how to divide or you don't know how to multiply. So, so you have to first let that go and let go of the embarrassment that they feel of not knowing this at the age of 16, 17, or 18. Now some of you are thinking, wait a minute, but I learned this stuff when I was in third grade, fourth grade. <laughs> Right, is that what you're thinking? <laughs> and one of the things I told him from the beginning is, listen, obviously you've all seen this before. This is not something new. The difference is that now you're going to master it. In this class, we're all going to care for each other, and we're going to help each other progress and get better. You become like a coach in that situation. Like, I kept thinking this is like a coach pep talk before the big game. We're here together. We're here for the same reason. We're here for the same goal. And we're all going to help each other to accomplish that goal. But let's step our game up. You know, it's funny you say that because I used to coach basketball and I, I love it. I guess I have experience building confidence and you know, I know how to motivate students in that way. I want you guys to help each other. I mean, I guess I am somewhat of a traditional listen, you know, as far as having them in rows initially, because I want them to be focused on me initially. I want them to understand, you know, 100% what this classroom is about. But then and once they understand that we are a community of learners here, I do want you to help each other to learn, then it's like, okay, we can break from the rows now working in cooperative learning groups, and or peer tutoring is expected from all students. When it's time for classwork, when it's time for group work, I'm only one person. Dude, this is the reason why I tell them, listen, if you grasp the concept well, if you get it, if you're done with the classwork, I need your help 
to help other students in this class. You do not need my permission to help someone. You can help someone sitting next to you or you can even get up, Melvin, if you want, get up and stand next to somebody and help them. Please, be my guest. And what I try to do too is I model for them how I want them to tutor other students. So I tell them repeatedly, I sound like a broken record, I say, don't give them the answer, show them how to get the answer, right? Ask them about their thought process. Well, two times two is four, this one's two five. In my experience of teaching teachers, one of the big anxieties that new teachers have is very much this idea of giving them that kind of autonomy or power in the classroom because they worry about this classroom management thing. Yeah. You know, that if you let kids group up and to work together, that it's going to become this big social free-for-all. Good, now finish up your function table. And once you finish that up, Melvin, I'd love for you to help someone with tell them. I mean, that doesn't tend to happen in your classroom, so I just wondered if you could address that. Side conversations do happen once in a while, and that's why it's very important to be an active, very active listener. So I have a very trained ear, and of course, if I hear, you know, talk, I can tell, obviously, if it's math-related, if it's related to the work, or if it's not related to the work. And if it's not related to the work, I immediately address it. This table over here, I'm gonna sit with you guys. With the group thing, I've never even really thought about that, that putting them in groups would cause chaos. It's funny. That's interesting. Just... So the fact that maybe partly because you absolutely don't even have it in your like, I have expectation, an your expectation yeah. is something very different, yeah. and so it just hasn't come out that way. Right. Are you going into that website, right? I mean, I've, I've walked into your classroom numerous times when the kids are involved in research projects, mm -hmm. right. and I walk around the room, and they're not on Facebook. Right. They really are doing the research right. and very involved, and I always find that really fascinating. Like Mr. Barbier, you have no fear about having kids engaging in that way mm -hmm. and taking control of their own learning in mm -hmm. that way. It doesn't go there. Okay, okay, scratch that. We're done with DNA. And so I wonder whether that's partly what's happening mm -hmm. with the success you guys have in the classroom is that you both carry yourself in a way where the, it's clear the expectations are high, that you're respecting the students and respecting the fact that you know that they can step up to yeah. those levels. So we have 25 to 35,000 genes. And I think it's something you as the teacher need to really, really, truly deep down feel, believe, and own, and that's what you transmit in the classroom. Uh, what are some other molecules you guys know about? I think that's more effective than anything sometimes, is just that you have that belief in them and that you have that respect Question. for them right. as human beings and as students with massive potential. For some of them, that might be the first time a teacher has Actually been like that. Them. Please, you guys see, I generally keep the room in this kind of a setup. So, Ms. Wilson, your classroom setup, I think, is also interesting because you do have the tables. Um, you have it set up in the U mm -hmm. so they that, so that they all sort of have to face you, right? Yeah. So is that a conscious choice? Can well, it's, it's less about facing me. It's more about being in a circle so that we are, you know, the... I guess the sense is that we're a, a group. In my class, you're going to be doing a lot of reading out loud, presenting, sharing your ideas. I have to find a balance then in establishing myself as the leader of the room, and it's also our experience together as a group. You want to switch gears and get into science mode. And I also intentionally move myself around the room to change the dynamics. My intention is that when they walk into my classroom, it's a very different experience than they've had previously. That's more my comfort zone as a teacher and also what I feel is an effective way to prepare them to be sitting in a more sophisticated classroom environment. Another observation I have about you is the way you change the language of the classroom. So rather than uh, students will be able to kind of thing or a do now kind of thing, whatever, you have the agenda for the day. Yes, I'm Canadian and French Canadian. I like to just take the opportunity to teach you guys a little bit of French throughout the semester. Every day you'll see de faire. De faire means to do in French, okay? So it's our to-do list. So every day they come in and they say they see the de faire, so they know what to expect. It's kind of like we're on the same page. I'm laying it out, what the expectations are and what we're going to do, and this is what we all need to accomplish. And I think I really stressed from the beginning high expectations for behavior and effort and just being, showing up and being present and being ready to be engaged. So we're going to go detail by detail through the syllabus. Something I want to ask about also is that both of you are so prepared on that first day of giving them a syllabus that has things spelled out. Can you talk to me about that? What's the importance of that? It's like doing the to-do every day. It's giving a map for the day. The syllabus gives a map for the whole semester or the whole cycle. So the only the problem with that, I think it does lay down, you know, the initial understanding of what the course description and the schedule and all that. But I just on day one, I know that they're taking in a lot of information. 
some of them it's literally their very first day back in school for months or years so I'm not sure how much is retained on that first day but I still think the actual act of doing it and slowly going through the course description is really really important just to lay down a foundation and set kind of the standard um, but I, oh, I go back to it all the time. To engage students in an understanding of the community and public health issues facing themselves and their community. Of like going back to it and going back to it and constantly reiterating it. I mean, that's the transitional part of this process, right? right? right. Where you're going from, you know, the, t the teacher of the school is going to dictate when you're going to do this kind of learning or that kind of learning to this is what's going on. You should be planning for it and thinking mm -hmm. ahead. I think that's mm -hmm. really, really important. So this is pre pretty much what the chart looks like, right? You have mom, dad, egg, sperm, phenotype. So I'm going to ask you both then also then about that idea of how do you feel like you infuse kind of that college prep in both your classrooms. Again, it's the way that I perceive them is that they are college prep students. Like I do not perceive them as high school students or GED prep students. There's one chromosome pair of the 23 that is your sex chromosome. They're college prep students. That's so enmeshed in the way that I'm teaching them. So everything. I, I'm doing in the classroom is about preparing them for college. The skills, how to write a research paper, how to take notes, and how to analyze, think creatively, um, and then also then the content, you know, going over the basics in, in science. Remember, the goal of CUNY Prep is to prepare you for what? College. For college. Well, we're preparing for the GED, number one, right? That's foundational step number one. Even though I have a class of the calculators, what you see now, you're not going to see this again until probably mid-February, because we're not using these calculators. I'm being very serious. You see that? They tell them that you have to master your foundational skills, that you have the best calculator in the world, and that's this, your brain. As you write it down, I still make sure that they have these other skills mastered as well, such as note-taking. I want you to have an organized notebook. I'm going to start off just having you guys fill out an introduction form. So talk to me about first day assessments. Does that happen right away? And if so, how does that happen? I used to do an actual assessment, like a knowledge assessment, of seeing what their background knowledge was um, on the first day. I just found that at that day one, that wasn't necessarily the tone that I wanted to set. So I do it internally, just getting a feel for what type of student is sitting in the room. You're getting all antsy, okay? So, are um, you following along with us? Based on the way they hold themselves, the way they talk, the way they interact, are they speaking up? Uh, are they talking to other students? Really just their nonverbal cues. And so, how does that help you? When I have sat in a lecture where I'm just like, this person isn't finding out who's in the room, they're not, they're talking at us, then I shut down. You know, so I think about that when I teach. Statistics show that such and such issues are occurring in the Bronx. We have really try to personalize everything here so I can understand in what way do I need to interact with them, what way is going to help them to either pull them out of their shell and feel comfortable, or if you can tell that they're already like an over-enthusiastic type of student, um, how to help them, you know, maintain and control their energy levels. <laughs> Which one of these colors would you like to write with? That student could be, you know, the bane of your existence if you let them. But then, you know, if you channel that energy and say, listen, you know, hey, you have the opportunity to earn, you know, extra credit by coming up to the board to, you know, reteach, you know, a topic or a concept, then they'll jump for it because, you know, like, wow, now they're the center of the attention. Yes. I also use the board as a way of giving them that confidence. If I put a problem on the board and a student who lacks that confidence gets it and knows how to do it, they're going to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I know how to do that problem. Let me go up there and demonstrate that I know how to do it. And it's a confidence booster for them. The other thing I'm trying to gauge, too, is by asking questions and, and depending on who comes up to the board or whatever, I'm assessing already their knowledge and skill level so that I can see who can I count on during the cycle to be, you know, my, my student teachers, so to speak, you know, my tutors. I'm going to take the side of a bigger number. Correct, correct. To be a better teacher, you have to constantly ask yourself, can I do this better? Is there a better way to do it? That's what we're all about here at Community Prep. That's one of the things I love about this school. So your left leg is out, right, gentlemen? Take your right arm up in the air. Teaching is an art, you know, and as an artist, you're constantly changing your perspective and changing your details and um, changing your style and building upon it and improving but also trying to branch out and try new new things. And look back over that back shoulder. So I think if you see it in that way as this dynamic profession, as this dynamic art form almost. Nice Amanda. You know, 
know, staying open to trying different things. You know, that's what keeps it fresh and keeps you inspired. I know that for a fact as well. Community purpose, it's, it's an expectation to constantly change how you're doing things. It's not just encouraged, it's expected. Now granted, is it extra work? Yes. <laughs> is it frustrating at times? Absolutely. So you have to be open and willing to make those changes and accept the extra work that comes with it. But the end result is magical. Yeah. Messi, now that was good.